July and August are the months when the family of the big house are likely to be in residence. For the garden staff, this meant extra attention to the task of keeping the gardens neat and tidy. It's often tedious and repetitive work, but, as Harry thankfully discovers, Victorian technology came to the aid of some of the more back-breaking tasks. The first lawnmower appeared in 1830. It was the invention of Edward Budding, who took the idea from a machine he saw in the Stroud Woolen Factory where he worked. This had rotary blades which sheared the raised nap or felt to give it a smooth finish. Thanks to Edward Budding, Victorian gardeners never knew their predecessors' toil when close cutting large lawns with a scythe. Some of the larger machines were drawn by horse, but ponies were preferred. Where there is considerable space to be mown, wrote the gardener's assistant, there is nothing better than an active, quick-walking pony with a 24-inch machine, which will do more work than a horse that is slower of foot and with a much larger implement. But horses or ponies could do damage to the lawn if precautions were not taken. This oof-looking object is a shoe for a horse, chiefly used in the spring of the year and again in the autumn when the ground was softer and it would have made quite large marks. On such a day and in such a conditions as we've been using it today, it's totally unnecessary because it's so hard and uh, it's hardly made a mark apart from the uh, bit of uh, indention on the, on the grass. The shoe is made of leather. It's extremely well made. Underneath, you've got this lovely row of copper studs and then some stronger steel studs in the middle. And uh, it was put on the ground and the horse's hoof was lifted up and put in and then the buckles was uh, tightened up afterwards. The wide expanse of lawns was one thing. The maintenance of the parterre, with its complex flower beds, quite another. Here, small machines and hand tools were the order of the day. As one writer observed, to be effective, beds cut out of turf had to have the edging of grass round them regularly trimmed so that they may always be viewed with satisfaction. But nothing was more demanding than keeping the carpet beds regularly clipped and their patterns true. And nothing was more precarious than perching above the bed on a plank suspended between two logs. There was no space between the plants for a gardener's big boots. As events turned out, of course, we had to do it uh, every fortnight. But then I ran into another snag which added to our problems. Uh, the dry weather caught up with us. And it was perfectly obvious that uh, some of the items were suffering from the dry weather. So on had to go the irrigation. The plants immediately responded to the irrigation, but that also brought on the problems Instead of running a fortnight, uh, it had to be done in only just over the week. So it, it was very labour intensive until we got out of August.
In the rose house, the flowers are over, but care and maintenance goes on. Harry has suffered the scourge of a rose grower's life, an attack of mildew. To combat it, he's used the Victorian's recommended treatment of dusting the leaves with flowers of sulphur. The bellows operated applicator is appropriately named the sulphurator. It's simple but effective. The main problem was, was the dust from it. If you had a house to do, say a house this size, and it was biggish plants in there, by the time you finished, you had practically as much on the front of you and, and uh, in your air very often as, as what you've got on the plants. Taking a break from maintenance work, Harry removes some plantlets from the fern Asplenium bulbiferum. Once propagated, they will become useful parlour plants. The Victorians had a great passion for cultivating ferns. They showed them off indoors, they built special glass houses for them, they grew them in the garden. Yet of all the crazes that swept Victorian England, none was so pernicious as that of fern collecting. For 20 years, until the 1870s, hordes of amateur enthusiasts scoured the countryside in search of novel forms. They were eminently respectable, doctors, clergymen, ladies of impeccable character, yet they did immense harm, causing several ferns to become extinct in the wild. thing they were looking for. Any plant that deviated from the normal and in ferns that usually means a distortion of the fronds. They called them monstrose or crestate. They were terms of endearment. Very much a case of beauty in the eyes of the beholder. The collectors had special trowels made with long thin blades and curved in both directions to give them enough strength to dig into these hillsides. Specimens were carried home safe and fresh in the Victorian plant collector's hold all, the vasculum. I've permission to dig up a specimen from the collection growing on this hillside, but of course after filming, I'll replant it. The precise locations of many rare ferns were published in guidebooks. Such overexposure led some naturalists to warn of the damage being done. As a result, strenuous efforts were made to check indiscriminate collecting. In July 1888 in Tiverton, there was a case of a group of fern robbers being prosecuted. In the Museum of North Devon at Barnstable, the Fern Hunters Hall is on display. A few were transplanted but a lot found themselves dried, pressed and mounted in herbarium sheets to make up books like this. The craze produced literally hundreds of titles, a whole library of books, from the serious to those for the amateur. But it didn't end at that. 
Fern fronds became one of the most popular forms of decoration. When you sat at your dining table, very cloth was embossed with them. And the bread dish is decorated with sprigs of maidenhair fern. The butter dish and even the Stilton cheese resides beneath them. The silversmith joined in. The bowl of this spoon is covered in fern fronds of several species. And you couldn't escape it, even if you took to drink. Some ferns found their way to even stranger places. Fine cliffs of sandstone rock, as in nature, is found tints of brown, grey and red, all ranged around, not as if stones piled by the workman's hand, but strikingly natural, effective and grand. Along garden-esque paths that endure for all time, formed by curves that do with grace combine, through rugged arches of rock to pass in and out by an undulating way, winding round about. Words written not by a romantic poet, but by a builder. His name was James Pullum, and this is a sample of his work. Alongside their obsession for collecting ferns, the Victorians were equally enthusiastic about building deep ravines and high cliffs in their gardens. We may think these places exaggerated, more like a Hollywood film set than the gentle art of gardening, but they loved them, and not least because it gave them the opportunity to show off their fern collections. This is the rock garden at Madrasfield Court. And if you're wondering how many hundreds of tons of rock must have been quarried to build this place, the answer's none. Because believe it or not, it's all handmade. The Pullums advertised widely and would travel to a prospective site to assess what rocks were needed. Their commissions were not exclusively horticultural and included Brighton Aquarium, the rocks in Battersea Park, and the bear enclosure at London Zoo. When commissioned to make a rock garden, the Pullums preferred to use natural stone. But if there was no local quarry and transport was too expensive, well, they simply set to and made it on the spot. The bulk they did in brickwork or concrete. And then they rendered that with Pullamite cement, which they moulded to create a texture and strata. They were wonderful craftsmen, but over the course of a hundred years, the Pullamites weathered away in a few places to reveal the brickwork underneath. If you look carefully, you can still make out Pullum's name scratched in wet cement by one of his workmen. A journalist visited Madrasfield in 1888 and reported that the imitation is so perfect that we have to assure ourselves of its artificiality. But it wasn't long before gardeners started to question just how satisfactory these shallow pockets in the Pullamite really were when it came to growing their favourite plants. They're a bit like flower pots, and although they hold enough soil, 
They hardly reproduce the conditions that ferns and alpines would experience in nature, where their roots would ramify through the cracks and crevices in the stones. The owner of this house in Reading had his fernery built onto his drawing room. He then simply had to step into it for a stroll after lunch. Again, the ferns are grown in spectacular settings of pulamite caverns, rock pools and waterfalls. But it was the creating of an outdoor fernery that was a particular favourite, perhaps because it was the easiest to establish. As one book noted, a day's leisure and a fern hunt of an hour or two's duration will be rewarded with sufficient fines to furnish a small, hardy fernery. For our fernery, Harry's selected a small glade in the shelter belt behind the walled garden. It fulfills the conditions Victorians regarded as essential. Shelter, shadow, humidity, and a rich root run. Most hardy ferns, of course, are completely happy uh, anywhere in the woods where they get dappled shade, and usually they're quite happy to grow on the rubbish that is already on the forest or the woods floor. Uh, anything that is, that is coarse and porous a fern will root into. Uh, leaf soil, peat, fern, bracken, uh, the roots of fern, anything like that they will root into. Hardy ferns, of course, are as, they, as the word says, they are hardy, they will tolerate anything that the English climate can throw at them. Keeping paths clean, weeded and rolled and general maintenance on them uh, was a thing that uh, great attention was paid to. I well remember once when I was only a boy, I don't think I'd even left school, I used to be uh, employed to go and weed certain areas of the path. It was done with a, a broken dinner knife and uh, it was a pretty laborious sort of a job. And I remarked to the man in charge that uh, there was a weed killer would do this. And I quickly got the reply, yes, laddie, and if we put the weed killer down, the boss wouldn't require you. <laughs> the gnats bit you, it was really miserable. Uh, the lines was pretty good in there. England is a garden, isn't it? Well, uh, better men than we go out and earn their working lives. They're grubbing weeds from gravel paths with broken dinner knives. <laughs> I learned that at quite an early age. After that, Harry had his tongue firmly in his cheek when he asked me to give him a hand with the mechanical hedge trimmer. This monster is clearly ahead of its time. It should have waited for the development of the petrol engine. If you wind even and as fast as you can, the easier <laughs> it'll be for both of us. Oh, very good. Well, <laughs> wait a minute. Let me see how it goes to start with. This, that's the action, is it? That's the action, okay, yeah. Well, I can Keep it that. even. And I'm don't... not sure I can manage it for several hours, uh -huh. but ready? Yes. Off we go, then. Well, when I first came here in 1947, the old of the edges around the mansion was cut by a tool like this. God and it gracious. used to take an access of six weeks. I should jolly well think it did. But the two that used it, of course, had used it several years together 
and uh, they were a very good combination, <laughs> and it really did make a, a very good job of it. By which time, one of them had good arm muscles, Well, oh, yes, they did. I think I'm doing quite well. I, I think you are, yes. I should imagine that somewhere about the first five years was the work. <laughs> After that, I think they begin to get used to it and used to one another, and uh, they yeah. did really make a good job of it. Well, so I think... you've got to hold it at a slight angle to ah, the face sorry. of the edge. There we go. So it's the top now? Yes, it is, and uh, I'm rather afraid this is going to prove that uh, we have done the easy bit. <laughs> is that this, right? Yes, well, this I is suppose not most of the growth's coming up, particularly the <laughs> strong is, stuff. Yes, there's so it's some, all it's, all, it's all muscle this time. Very good, sir. Right. <laughs> I think you could keep a good speed up for this top stuff, Harry. Ooh, yes, it's jammed, is, you see there. This is a bit tough. There's no way yes, to it. Yes, this separated the men from the boys. I'm afraid so. I don't know which category I'm going to get into, but I've got a horrible suspicion it isn't going to be the men. <laughs> That's right. Oh. The, the cuttings fall in front of you, and yeah. then it jams the knife, and that's about as far as you can go. I and think there's a bit in between the blades. In. Well, to have gone through that with a machine this age, I think is pretty good. Well, look, it's quite level. Yeah, it shows it shows their skill here, even if well, there's not we're, muscle. We're improving. Let's Off we just go again. Say that. Right. Let the rest. Yes, I shall. Yes. It's arm aching, this one, and uh, when it gets like this and keeps on getting like it, uh, this is when the uh, gardener's excuses wants to come in. What's that? You then? know, that well, they, they take it away and make it, it needs sharpening or needs oiling or get the knife out and, and clean the blades off, anything to get yeah. a breather. In their striving after the exotic, the Victorians devised the subtropical bed. For the summer season, the grandest foliaged pot plants from the Glasshouse Range were plunged in strategic spots in the leisure grounds. The beds, says the gardener's assistant, enable us to obtain pleasing and varied glimpses of luxuriant tropical vegetation, otherwise unobtainable in our northern climate. Right, set your palms down in the holes then. Best side to London, all of you. That looks fine. I've never had anything to do with this sort of planting or growing before. I've read of it, and uh, 
I've thought from time to time when I've seen it that uh, it might be a bit far-fetched and yet the more you read it, uh, the more you sort of thought, well, they did have something. And uh, I can now see lots of benefit and, and lots of beauty to it, especially if it was a, a nice warm summer and there was uh, some of the uh, rains from heaven which kept the foliage washed and cleaned. I can well imagine that some went back into the uh, greenhouse positions in the autumn in a better and fresher condition than what they came out in the spring. problem, of course, must have always been with them. I mean, it, it doesn't matter how eh? well an area is protected. A certain amount of wind gets through. And if it was too well protected, well, then I could well imagine that uh, it would have had uh, quite an heavy shade and the dankness and the poor light. I don't think uh, the subjects that we've bedded out here today would have taken so kindly to it as ours have in this more exposed and uh, shade-free site. 